Well, you know, anyway. okay. so, what we'll do now is, is Chris will give us his, his primer, a 10 minute sort of introductory talk, and then we'll fill up the other panel members and go into the Q&A. So, um, and I know we'll, we'll want to get going, so let's, let's go straight into it. So thanks, Chris. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, the reason I said the changing climate rather than climate change is that it's not just a single problem of carbon emissions and... and uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming. There are all these other factors destroying the soil, running out of resources, rising population, health issues, um, nature deficit disorder, um, increasing poverty, the global economy wobbling away, nobody quite knows what the hell's going to happen. So really, although these things seem to be um, disconnected, in a way they're not. They are symptoms, if you like, of a single problem. And that's the fact that we tend to just consume. Um, we dig something up, we use it once through, we don't bother much about efficiency, we throw it away. Um, recycling needs to be integrated into the production paradigm. We need to think at the start what we're going to do with something at the end of it. That's not really what happens at the moment. So presently, this has been called the sins of the farmers, I forget by whom, but it's, you might say it's an impoverishing scenario where we're getting through the finite resources year on year and polluting the earth in terms of carbon and in other ways and by the processes that consume them. Now the alternative is what I, I have termed growth. Uh, that's not mine, this one is. Growing our way to hope. Where if we can't grow on a global scale, we can actually grow locally, we can grow local economies, we can produce more of our materials, our food, the things that we actually need um, on the local scale. And also to use energy more efficiently by, for example, um, draft proofing your house. I mean, we did that seriously at home, we saved about 20% of our, our energy bills. There's a hell of a lot you can do as an individual. Um, and permaculture is something I, I'm quite interested in. Um, permaculture, it's not just about gardening. I mean, it, it's about having a good design. You can apply it to all sorts of things. But in terms of, of the context of producing food locally, if you get your good design, you get the right symbiosis between different plants, you have plants in the right place, you're harvesting as much water and all the rest of it, you greatly reduce the amount of inputs, um, your crude oil, your natural gas, your artificial fertilizers, uh, fresh water, but also you're, you're rebuilding the soil uh, from carbon that's actually taken up from the atmosphere. So it's a sort of win-win situation. What permaculture is no good for is large-scale industrialised farming. We'll have to get away from that. That's just not going to be tenable in the future. But we're going to have to get away from that anyway. We're running out of resources like uh, phosphorus um, that enable that to happen anyway. And giant uh, machines, combine harvesters, that are run uh, on liquid fuels refined from uh, crude oil. You know, when crude oil is $200 a barrel and fuel is a couple of quid a litre, then it's going to start to look um, a bit um, undesirable to carry on in this way. It's just not going to be economic. So a more local approach is perhaps the way to go. So transition. Transition means a lot of things to uh, a lot of different people. Probably means something special to every one of us. But I think we need to ask, what kind of a society are we aiming for? What, what do we actually want under the end of all this? You know, um, there seems generally, uh, not within the transition movement and the green movements, but there's a general effort, say, among governments to try and maintain the status quo. Okay, if we don't have enough oil, well, we can run everything on hydrogen or electricity or something like that. Well, we can't actually. But the, conceptually, that is what... Um, people want to do. Nobody really wants to change. I'm not sure I want to change unless I'm forced to. I sort of like the way things are, but I realise it's thoroughly unsustainable and bad in all, all sorts of respects. So we need to build a kind of parallel infrastructure, a plan B. So this is building things on a local scale, so everybody does have a permaculture allotment. Um, you need to think, what do you do for a living? I mean, do, do we need to travel? I mean, I live in rain. Reading is well known as a commuter town. 70,000 people um, every day commute from Reading, mostly into London, to go to work. What I didn't realise until recently is an almost equal number commute into Reading 
mostly from London uh, and surroundings every day. And that's largely to do the high tech jobs. So you think, well, if you could reskill the Reading folk to do the jobs in Reading, and the London folk could do the jobs in London, then you're saving fuel both ways. But I'm not too sure that all these, these jobs that people commute um, into London or Reading to do will actually exist in 10 or 20 years. If these are global companies, they may not exist. So the jobs people, all of us, are likely to be doing uh, in future is growing stuff, is making stuff, is doing things practically, running local economies. You know, we're, we're, have you um, sort of, has it been tossed around, the idea of the Swindon Pound? We're sort of vaguely <laughs> talking about the Reading yeah. Pound. Yeah. I, think we, yeah. I think we've got yeah. more serious priorities. But yeah, I mean, I can kind of see um, advantage, and for a start, you're not losing vast amounts uh, from the economy in terms of taxation or supermarkets and um, sort of uh, hiding off huge amounts. You know, the, the resource of uh, money um, does actually do what it's supposed to do. It goes round and round and circulates within, within the local economy. So that, that's a possibility. But reskilling and, and resilience, that's kind of what we're talking about. And um, repurposing of waste, as I say, the one through thing. We dig something up, we use it, we chuck it out. Incredibly wasteful. Um, the day may come when people will be mining uh, landfill uh, tips. I mean, it's, it's quite possible. I mean, the roadside dust contains something like three parts per million of platinum. Interesting. It's about the same as in platinum ore, which is what they dig up to make it from in the first place. This is the platinum that's eroded from catalytic converters. Amazing. Yeah, but when, for example, if you had a, a fridge, say, then you get fridges being chucked on landfill sites. But you could not, with too much, without well, too much difficulty, you could design the thing <coughs> at source so that it could be actually deconstructed, so you could re reuse it, you could scrap it, and, and so on. I mean, this applies to so many things. Yeah, local economy, sustainable jobs. What are we going to be doing in the future? Are we going to be commuting into London? No, I don't think so. There'll be nothing to do. Urban permaculture. I like this very much. There's a lot more available space within an urban setting than is immediately obvious. Um, you know, the example which you're probably well aware of that comes to mind is Cuba. Right. Um, when communism collapsed, uh, Cuba was in a, a hell of a, a tricky situation because the Russians used to give Cuba a lot of cheap fuel and pesticides and so forth because they were an outpost of communism that overlooked America effectively. So it, it was uh, worth their while keeping them going. When communism collapsed, then within a period of a few years, suddenly these supplies were, were no longer available. So they had to face a kind of peak oil situation, how to survive, how to grow their own food particularly, without these external inputs. And they did survive. Um, Havana grew practically all the, the vegetables and fruit that it needed. And it's called the special period in peacetime, or just the special period. But it said the average Cuban lost about two stones in weight during this period. But they survived. And they produced more medical doctors, um, sort of per capita, as it were, than anywhere else in the world. So they kept the reputation uh, system going as well. But they went through it, and they came out of the other side. And Cuba only has a few million people. We've got about 60 million in this country. It's going to be uh, quite a, a challenge. But uh, it's, it's interesting to, to look and, and see how it has been done before. Yeah, what is wealth? Creation of local wealth. Wealth, food, materials. Um, not just stuff, but also social cohesion. A lot of what transition is about is building strong communities um, that can share skills, and support one another um, in, in, in various, various different ways. And th what sort of society are we aiming for? Well, we, we'd like to be socially cohesive. I mean, when uh, the proverbial hits the fan, we don't all want to be hacking each other to bits to get it to what's left. We want to be getting on with each other and cooperating. Good health, sufficiency, um, equity, yeah, an, an equitable society. Equanimity, hmm, indeed, I think it's going to take a fair bit of mental resolve, actually, and uh, sort of inner strength to get through the time of pain. Um, local energy efficiency, yeah, better insulation, draft proofing, makes a tremendous difference. That's just something any individual person can do. Local energy uh, generation, solar, uh, biomass and combined heating and power systems, possibly. It all helps. 
But the idea of transition can become a hub. It can stimulate public debate. It can pull people together um, in, in difficult times. And this is going to be important, I think, in, if you like, teaching teachers about transition and sustainability. Because I think right from really the grassroots level, um, from uh, early school level, it's going to be necessary to inculcate uh, the young into ideas of sustainability um, and to get away from this uh, idea of consumerism, which is something that clearly uh, we're running off the road of at the moment. And it is going to require a deep understanding to uh, arrive at a state of resilience. Now, transition, um, as uh, noted, I'm talking uh, about universities as, as a starting point. So, difficult, you can imagine transition in a, a small town, um, a village certainly, Totnes, they seem to have made some way there, that was uh, like the, the starting point. But what would a transition university look like, possibly? Well, you could have courses with both practical and academic components. So you could actually give students uh, allotment spaces and uh, appropriate training so they actually get in touch with nature and produce uh, their own stuff. And it's something to, to get your head around. That's all part of education for the, for the time at hand. And you know, things about uh, reducing carbon footprints and uh, trying to avoid getting into debt, uh, good money, money management. Well, people used to know about this sort of thing. There didn't used to be credit cards, did there? Um, promoting the concepts of localism and resilience within the university, but actually acting as a hub within the community, um, sort of talking to local businesses, talking to the local council, that sort of thing. I mean, there is some connection between Reading University and we've got the Reading um, Climate Change Partnership, which I'm on the board of as part of Transition Town Reading. And really, a lot of the things that you can do to cut your carbon emissions actually necessitate uh, burning less carbon. So the same actions uh, help in the face of peak oil and fossil fuel problems and uh, carbon emissions. And it, it all... It all looks like the way to go, basically. All these problems um, are a single problem. They're just different manifestations of it. And that's sort of what, I, what I, I'm saying there, that the university could be a key driver um, for um, a sort of hub for pulling people together across the community, including businesses. The universities could actually send people out to local schools and colleges. I mean, uh, I... I'm a visiting professor at a few universities, I don't formally work for one, but I certainly do outreach stuff in schools and so on and talk about, about this, this kind of thing. So, as I say, what a university could become is, is a kind of uh, a hub and uh, lead by example, effectively. That's, that's really what it could do within a, a community. And universities should be more part of communities. They shouldn't be some ivory tower um, on the outside of town. They, they really need to engage. Now, Bill Mollison, um, he is the father, uh, certainly, yeah, probably is the father of permaculture. Yeah, if every university on earth was destroyed, we would lose nothing. If we lose the forest, we will have lost everything. Now, rather good. I think what he means is that, okay, universities are, um, well, they are, they are hubs and collectives of knowledge of various kinds. But permaculture is about learning from nature. Uh, getting a good design from how uh, nature does things. And that's what he's saying, that once we lose all our practical skills and our knowledge of nature and our contact with nature, well, what have we got left? We've got these, basically. And um, that's about it. We're, we're, we're isolated. We're in a sort of bubble. And in the future, we are going to need far fewer universities. And I think the way forward is that many current universities will have to transform to teach more practical subjects. Like I was saying, the Polytechnic's looking back to what they used to uh, be good at. Not necessarily doing that same thing, but that kind of thing. And I think more respect for practical knowledge and, if you like, people who get their hands dirty. There seems to be a, a rather British uh, problem of looking down on people who do the practical stuff. I've never quite understood it, actually. Um, you know, but uh, that, that seems to, to be our way. Certainly, we're going to need a lot of knowledge 
and our education system in general we, we're going to ask uh, a lot uh, from in the time to come, but not in its present form. Life skills, the practical stuff, I think need to be introduced from really, really early on. And yeah, we'll need more of the, the practical folk, the electricians, the plumbers, and so on. Certainly if we're going to do things at the local level, and we can't rely on moving goods and people around because we've got limitless cheap oil. We won't have it anymore. So you might call it transition education, which applies to schools, colleges and universities, where much of what they do is rooted in sustainability and to provide the reskilling that we're going to need to uh, build these self-reliant uh, communities. And this, with any luck, will get us away from some of the woes that I was alluding to uh, earlier. In part, the transition movement um, is engendered by a lack of faith that they, our elected leaders, are going to sort all our problems out for us. And it's more what can we do at the local level? What can we provide for ourselves? Because the more we can provide at the local level, the less reliant we are on supplies of oil, supplies of food, this, that and the other, supplies of materials. And we are less vulnerable to these um, exogenous forces in that way. And I think that's a strong uh, seed of transition. Practical action for Swindon. I think Jerry asked me yeah, if I could come up with something for this. Well, uh, part of this, I, I could have crossed out Reading and uh, put Swindon there, because uh, some of this is what we're already doing uh, in Reading. Individual and community draft proofing. Okay, so people um, have learned how to um, draft proof their own houses. And then a group of us are going around in the local community and showing other people how to do the same thing. This is what I mean about people depending or, or relying on each other. Because everybody within a community has particular skills and we can share them and pass the, them on to each other. We can teach each other how, how to do things that are going to be necessary. Tree planting, we've got what we call our community orchards project. The idea is to plant um, five <coughs> orchards across Reading over the next uh, three years. Forest gardening will be another, another part of that. Um, have you come across something called RISC, R-I-S-C, the, uh, what on earth is it, the International Solidarity uh, yes. Centre? <coughs> it, it's an absolutely amazing place. Do you know about the roof of it? Mm. Yeah, uh, there's a forest garden uh, growing on the roof. You've got a foot of soil and you've actually got <coughs> trees growing up there. It's absolutely astonishing, but it's a perfect symbiosis. They have open days a few times a year, but it's absolutely wonderful. If you, you go into the building below, sometimes the garden starts to make its way through the roof, so you, you need to do something about that. But um, it's, it's quite astonishing, and they're a bit worried because it's grown so fruitfully. Um, there's an enormous weight of stuff on the roof. And they're getting the engineering department at the university to recalculate the stresses of the building because they're a bit worried. I mean, it's pretty strong. It's all steel girders. I think it ought to be okay. But it, it's, as I'm saying, um, urban permaculture. You can actually grow a forest garden on the roof of a building. Not suggesting that we need to do that everywhere. But you can use the spaces that are available to produce an enormous amount. And that was exactly what they did in Cuba. They used every uh, roof. You know, they dug up the car parks. Well, they didn't need the car parks anymore because there weren't any cars moving. Um, every bit of garden, allotments, whatever they had, and collectively they managed to produce well enough food to feed a, a city of three million people, practically. So, right. Oh, yeah. You've got this co-wheels um, scheme in Swinton, haven't you? It's a, a car share scheme, yeah? Well, yeah, car sharing is, is a good start, I think. Um, drive less, yeah, car share, walk, cycle, work from, work from home if you possibly can. That's what I do mostly uh, these days. Keep your tyres pumped up. Apparently if you have to drive it uses less fuel, so I'm told. Allotments, community gardens, provide food and materials. Yeah, make do and mend. Don't just chuck stuff away. I can imagine in the future the bloke who can repair computers and so forth is going to be quite useful. Um, and other electronic devices, because we're not going to be able to... No. Uh, you don't no. like so. You, Absolute rubbish. You don't like it, no? Have you seen the size of computers now? <laughs> You've got one in your pocket. It's called a mobile phone. Oh, yes. It's more powerful than the stuff they used to yeah. put to the moon on. But you don't think anybody should repair them? You just you can't! I used to be in the industry, my yeah. boy. <laughs> you cannot repair them. 
You pay 30 quid for a new motherboard with all the stuff on it, mm. you cannot repair them. That's why they do it. That's why they send them off to China. You can recycle. They don't. You can recycle. Recycle yeah. means burning the whole damn lot mm. and getting the gold and platinum that's left well, in they, it. They send but them you off, don't do anything else. They send them off to China to some poor China that ends up uh, uh, exposing yeah, themselves but, to God yeah, knows what was, toxic yeah, vapors. Yeah, yeah. rubbish. But we, I'm aware actually, of the time. Can we sort of yeah. get the yeah. answer <laughs> to get the people out of Okay, shut up all the time. I'm just going to get a chair in. Right, local redistribution and reuse. You've got, for example, services like Gumtree, Freegal, um, very, very useful. I got a, a very good table for a tenner out recently. Would have cost me, I don't know, whatever it would have been in John Lewis's or somewhere for that. All very good. Um, yeah, one man's waste can be another man's um, joy, basically. Swindon Pound, well, it's a thought. New skills, yeah. We're going to have to become more <coughs> practical. Uh, I'm quite into carpentry, but gardening, um, micropower production, so on and so forth. So, and finally, my novel, uh, which was my attempt, um, partly out of frustration, but um, really to point out some of the severe deficiencies within the university system, but also to indicate perhaps where it ought to be going in the future, especially at the time of hand. And there are some copies over there if you want one. Although the publisher wants 14 quid, I'll give you a copy signed for a tenner if you like. Thank you. Can't say tenner. <laughs> okay, that's my uh, spiel uh, done. Thank right. You. Thank you. The end was to be four, not no, monetary wise. You can't sustain, you can't sustain, a, a, you know, a few people with lots of money and they've got 99% and very little. So you're going to have to level down, you're going to have to just do a big selling job on that, aren't you? Yep, true. But people are getting poorer uh, all the time uh, with the status quo. Uh, we'll have to build our wealth um, maybe in a non-monetary uh, way. Because the world economy um, is going to steadily crumble, the global economy. So it's going in that direction anyway. So this is about creating, as I say, um, a kind of safety net. Um, an alternative infrastructure. You know, we, we, we've got to sort of build a parachute, haven't we, basically, before uh, we need to jump. But you're right. I mean, it's not going to be possible to provide from local and renewable energy sources the equivalent of the amount of energy that we get through from the fossil fuels at the moment. It's a completely, it's a complete rethinking of, of how we live, and you know, that, that, that is no mean challenge. I mean, maybe we won't be able to pull it off, but uh, or not very easily. You know, the transition, uh, we would like to think it's going to be a smooth business, but it could be a bloody business if it all goes wrong. So, so politicians need a role in kind of change people's expectations, isn't that really? Uh, yeah, don't uh, give people the expectation that they all ought to be going to university, maybe. I'm going to do a rubbish bit of chairing now and actually answer, answer a question myself as well, because on that one, I, I wrote a um, curriculum for resilience training for young unemployed people in a subsequently counselled unemployment programme. Um, and because it dawned on us that all the skills that you actually need for resilience, growing your own food, learning to use public transport, learning to maintain and ride a bike, adopting a value system where, you know, other things dictate your quality of life other than material wealth. All those skills and abilities, not only do they help you live more sustainably, but they actually make your life more, more resilient to, you know, the behaviour of idiot bankers and the vagaries of the economic systems. And it actually makes your individual life resilient against the economic impacts on your life that we're all suffering from now. So actually, I think the resilience training is, is, is in part going to help a response to people becoming poorer. So, I don't know if other panel may have gone off on I just was thinking of the researchers who wrote the book The Spirit Level and, and how uh, they found that actually in an unequal society where people are, some people are beyond a certain level of, of, of income, people aren't really any happier. And mm -hmm. in societies where things are more equal, where there aren't so many extremes of such extremes of rich and poor, everyone is happier. The rich people are happier. The richer people are happier, and the less rich people are happier when it's more equal. So mm -hmm. maybe that re I think that research has quite a big effect 
and that message might sink in a bit that actually just getting more and more material. Do you not think well, the message needs to sink in an awful lot quicker? Mm -hmm. From what the from what I've heard when listening to TED talks, one of some of the scientists there said, We're living we we're using hundred and fifty percent of the world's resources at the present moment. So everything is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. The oil resources, they reckon, is flatlining in 2015. Even though they're finding little bits, mm -hmm. but that's flatlining. That means fuel will rocket before yeah. long. It's not going to be two pound a litre. It's going to be three, four yeah. pound. Because my next door <coughs> neighbour is on the oil markets. And he's absolutely surprised that it's not two pound a litre mm -hmm. already. Because yeah. the, the way they're doing it, and the people who buy it and sell it on the market, it, it's same with grain at the present moment, they're doing it. And that's why the prices are going up, because lots of people are making a lot of money. Yeah. I, Incredible I amounts of money. That, um, I sort of have hope, because I think humans, people, are incredibly resourceful and resilient. And I think that even though there probably will be really tough times, we have ways of surviving, and you just have to hope people will do it in a cooperative way and not fight wars and things. But I, I like to think positively that we are quite adaptable when we have to be, and maybe we need to be forced to be adaptable before it will actually happen. Can we have a question? Sorry. You know, I, I, I uh, probably have fears about Armageddon type scenarios, actually, because yeah. uh, nice middle class people like me. Can be adaptable and flexible, mm. and maybe have the resources to, you know, mm. play around with. But um, there's others will feel quite bad in the sorts. Well, we're, we're seeing it at the moment, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When when this government has now done this 56 quid, that's all you get as an unemployed person, <coughs> and they can and they're coming out the jails like they were showing on the telly the other night. He, he's thrown out into the street, 56 quid in his pocket. Live, my boy. What the hell is he going to do? There's no accommodation anymore for them. They live on the streets. They said, we're fighting to get back to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we, if we carry on like this and we've got this population growing, and it, I don't agree with the consumption side, I think it's people side. It's too many people. And, it's too, and that consumption is from people. None of us want to give up buying nice clothes, nice shoes, nice cars. But I'm not, I'm not sure some of us do. Some, some do, but there's an awful lot yeah. of people. Changing people's minds and attitudes mm -hmm. and the way we live is going to be one hell of a job. And it's going to be a long, hard fight. And what you're saying about Armageddon, I think, I think that sort of thing just, is not far away. Um, so I think uh, if we listen to, to Chris's ideas of how you can change the education system, then, I mean, we have to think positive, otherwise you we have. just give up. Well, you've got to start talking so to politicians, to think, you know, and you mustn't put them in power. Of um, starting with education. <laughs> can we have a question from someone who hasn't contributed yet? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just sort of spread I'm, it out a I'm bit. I'm quite new to all this, but I've been reading around the subject quite a lot. And one thing that I discovered is, you know, we can talk about resilience, but we need to cut our carbon emissions big time, mm. because you know, the, the degrees are just going to rise and rise and rise and then all it needs is another couple of degrees and, you know, we really are going to be in very big trouble. So carbon, apparently something like 30% of our carbon emissions come from transport, planes, trains, <coughs> um, cars, buses, and the infrastructure is not there to cut those carbon emissions and that would be such a fantastic way of reducing carbon emissions is to change the transport system. And I feel personally we need to be thinking far bigger than just creating resilience. I think that's necessary as well. I think we need to be lobbying Parliament and people who actually are more in power, who can do something about the transport system. I'm sure that, you know, it would take many, many years, and I'm not sure that's going to be quick enough, but I still think we need to be looking at our transport system. What do you I think know, about I that? I know Jerry's itching to come in on that one. Yeah. I also know that Chris has spoken on that at yeah. length as well. So that's yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with your ideal mm. and your vision. Um, but of course, the vested interests at the minute um, are all for more cars. Mm. And uh, in fact, courtesy of Milton Friedman and his mates, we're slashing public transport, not as though it is in this country. Mm. So uh, we, at, at a local level, are as active as the constraints allow in terms of promoting cycling and so on. But the big levers, the political levers, aren't there. Mm. In fact, there was an article in the Independent during the week 
but in the end, it depends, it must be true. Um, and uh, basically, all the government advisors have, have walked off um, because they're not being used for climate change and these issues. The speaker we had here last year, by the way, I, I think we should leave the room with, with efforts to be totally positive, but we should also be realistic. Uh, the, the politicians ain't going to do it. And um, the speaker we had here last year was a, uh, you'll, you'll hear him quite often on food issues, national food issues on radio and TV, Tim Lang. He more or less been sort of shoved between last year. Nobody, nobody, nobody at the minute in power wants to hear. It's all the short term business mm -hmm. of yeah. promoting unfettered capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Golden yeah. sacks are, are taken over the planet. Well, a quick question to yeah. everybody here. Yeah. How many of them have lobbied their MP? Mm. Well, how many of you have well, written to your <laughs> local MP? Yeah. 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 Stan meets yeah. its MPs regularly. Yeah. That's one of the things that, that well, Stan needs. Well, you have a look so. around, though. The voting, like in the local elections, we're under 30%. Mm -hmm. Now, lots of people don't even know what their MP is. And here, you, yes, a few of you have written, but that's, that's no big thing. Yeah. Everybody needs to do it. This guy who's talking tomorrow, Lord Sainsbury, I went up to London taking time off from work and spending money because thousands of us went up to lobby him on some, some items, like software patents for one particular, but, and we got nothing done. But that's because we didn't keep at it all the time. And you need to be consistent and persistent at these things. Because, like my local MP said to me, he said, Gordon, Listen to me, my boy. This is the way it is. I'm an MP. I know nothing at all about what's going on. I am your local postman. Mm. I take your letters and I give them to the man in charge and the people in charge. They write back to me. I know nothing about it. He says there's over 10,000 items of legislation going through Parliament every year. And we don't see most of them. So if I, if I can talk about the MP thing for a moment, and then I want to give Chris a chance yes. to talk yeah. about the transport <laughs> thing, because I know I've heard him speak on that before. But, but, but just to say very quickly on the MPs, uh, not me, but SCAN committee members do have a regular programme of meetings with our MPs. And yeah. so, you know, one of, one of the things that I think SCAN is good at as a local group is having not just the odd bit of lobbying or the odd petition, petition, but actually an ongoing dialogue with our MPs, and I'm quite proud of the committee members that do that work, I don't know if they're blushes, yeah. um, but if you do want to feed stuff or have issues that you think SCAN should be raising, then, then email us or get in touch with the committee, because I think that's one channel I, I think as a group would do that. Mm. Um, yeah. And of course we were quoted in Parliament by the previous MP in relation to the climate change bill. We actually had yes. a mention in Hansard for work. Yes. And as featured in Hansard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the Whether it made any yeah. difference is another question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to bring back to the, the transport thing and the, the sort of resource miles thing and give, mm -hmm. give Chris a chance because it, it went off, we went off on a tangent. I, mean, I know yeah. it, it's a specialism. So. Well, um, the, the most obvious thing is that uh, all the energy agencies predict that there's going to be a fairly rapid decline in the amount of crude oil available to us. So by 2030, which is less than 20 years, we'll have half the conventional crude oil. I don't think there's much chance that through fracking or a tar sands or any of these other schemes, that hole is going to be filled. So basically that's going to push the price up. But there won't be an availability of cheap liquid fuels. And statistically, you can imagine that that will mean a cutting of the amount of transportation that we have by two thirds within less than 20 years. And this is where localism or localization comes in. Because you know, if you suddenly lose that so much of your, your transportation fuel, because 90 odd percent of all forms of transport run on the fuels that are refined from crude oil, then what else do you do? You have to try and do what you can without travelling, without, without moving things. Um, or it, it's game over. I, mean, I, I did originally think, well, we were incredibly well provided for with energy in this country. This is before I heard about peak oil. And I thought that we could uh, get all our energy from the tides and uh, the winds and all that. And then I, I sat down and worked out how much energy we were 
amazing and realise that this is just an impossibility. I mean, the amount of energy we get out of fossil fuels is absolutely stupendous. And so we are going to end up gearing down to a poorer, if you like, a lower energy society and where we, we move around less because we won't, we won't have any choice. I mean, so I was at one of these council uh, meetings in Reading and there was a bloke there and he said, well, I can't understand why uh, people are so keen on trams. So it's just a bus that goes in one direction, isn't it? So I said, well, no, not exactly. I said, the point is that a tram runs on electricity, which can be generated from all sorts of different sources compared to a bus, which basically runs on crude oil. So, yeah, or gas, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's it. So it, it gives uh, more sort of flexibility uh, within the, the energy mix, if you like. But, you know, we're, we're not going to have 34 million, and there's 34 million oil-powered cars on Britain's roads at the moment, more than a billion across the world. But we're not going to have 34 million little electric cars anytime soon. <coughs> so personalised transport is going to go out of the window and uh, sooner rather than later. It, it must do. I mean, the only sensible way to move people around using electric power um, is mass transit using light railway systems and, and uh, trams, actually. Um, so if, if you're entirely reliant for your work or you're uh, going to buy your food or your other aspects of your life on a personalised oil-powered car, then things are going to change considerably in society. Mm -hmm. And there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, can I just add, Chris, um, given the fact that the myth of unconventional oil and gas is the thing that people want to believe will allow us to carry on living mm. as we do, have you got any insights into the best way of sort of tackling that issue and, and sort of, um, sort of so popping the, the bubble that people believe are at. Well, I did try the Daily Mail. Of Nigel Lawson, who was coming out with all this shit, basically, about <laughs> how it's going to be fine, no problems, 250 years worth of gas and all the rest it's of it. Shit. So I published, or I, I wrote um, a rebuttal to this, but they refused to publish it, actually. They want everybody to believe that uh, it's, it's all going to be okay. Um, so you can lobby your parliament, you, you can try getting uh, the Daily Mail and uh, other newspapers to take it, or you can go around giving talks, which is, is what I do refer to it actually, um, to try and raise awareness. But I mean, there's a huge mechanism uh, driven by the government and by the oil industry and so <coughs> forth, basically uh, overwhelming uh, probably the word of the, uh, the smaller people. Um, who were trying to tell the truth in the face of really um, like a blindfold over everybody as we walk off the, the edge of a cliff. And I think it's not going to be until things get really bad and maybe fuel is five quid a litre and you can't get it half the time that things are going to start to change because they'll have to. At the moment, we're too damn comfortable. Never had it so good. Yeah. Well, well one, of the, one of the things that will be happening, mm -hmm. and that is happening at the moment, in Germany they're linking, you might have all seen robot cars, like mm -hmm. Google have done their stuff in LA and that, but they've got in Germany and in Milton Keynes, they're linking the cars, so they are robot cars, yeah. right, but one car follows another, and they're looking at them being able to stop, so they're electric cars, but they'll be following each other, so mm -hmm. it's like a trailer going around. But they'll just be going around in set directions, just like a bus, but they'll be electric. So there's those sort of things that's sort of mm. on, that's going to be in the next sort of 10 years. Because mm. they've done a, quite a few of the roads in Germany where there's the wires in the road, and that's quite a cheap way of doing it. And all they do is follow the, follow the wire. Mm. So there's these little things that's happening, but electricity is the way that I, I expect things are going to happen. And it's atomic power stations. People might not like it, but it's the only way they're going to do it at the moment. But in Germany, lots of houses and that, and because of the Germans, they've done a lot of PV cells on roofs and places like that. There's one part of Germany, I've forgotten where it is, they've actually got so much electricity from PVs and PV farms that they, they're losing money from the government because it's, it's, they were subsidising it. But now there's so much there 
that they're actually losing money, tax revenue and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so they're, they're finding that they've got a, a surplus of electricity. So these sort of things are starting to change. And if every house that was built put 30% of the renewables on them, that would make a big difference. But the government ain't doing that either. But let's so have there's a nice all sort of things story. going on. Um, I, we had um, someone um, staying with us who worked for, I think it was uh, um, NPOW, one of those. He was basically um, buying and selling futures in electricity. That was his job, a young man. But he said that in Germany, the price of electricity fluctuates hugely because of sunshine, because they've got so many solar panels now. Mm. That it's, uh, so you can see the scale on which they're producing electricity from solar energy is phenomenal. And if only we had done that here, you know, with so, so, so Yeah, yeah. well, in Israel, that's where most of their stuff comes from. In, in, uh, you do, you do, yeah, like, I've got more some load, don't you, when, when the weather isn't good. Mm. Oh, yeah. Even yeah. Great big batteries. Well, of course, also, in, when it comes to housing and, and thermal properties, the, there is the passive house concept where you, oh, yeah. you don't bother <coughs> solar panels virtually except for your water. Mm. It's so spec, that spec is so good. Yeah, we had another speaker here actually on Sunday. And, uh, he was uh, he lives in a passive solar house that's been built in Lancaster. A little t um, mm -hmm. it's a co-housing project, mm -hmm. and they have one radiator in their house, and they've got the whole little estate is powered with a um, combi CHP, combined CHP. Combined CHP. Power, yeah. um, and their electricity bill bills are negligible. Their, yeah. their fuel, yeah. their power um, bills are very, very, very low. And uh, it's the design of the houses. It is. Unless we start doing this, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, I, think, I, I think Germany built something like 40,000 last year, and of course they're completely passe in places like Canada and Sweden mm. where they actually have real cold weather. Yeah. So Google passive house, but I mean. The Don't they use ground source heat pumps or anything like that then? Well, it virtually does away with that. You're, you're talking about warm hot water. Mm. But yeah. let's have a, another question. But we have got those in Swindon because we went we, uh, a couple oh, of years yes, ago. Yes. There was a small development which uh, the council actually yeah. supported. Yeah. Uh, it was so. about 20 houses. In, uh, mm. It was the biggest public sector housing development in the country or something at the mm. time, where which they built for incredibly high spec mm. with um, extra insulation. Where, where was that? It's in Park North. What's it called? Mm. That was the one that was on the grand design. Yeah. No, no, no. That's no. 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 Yeah. Similar kind of concept. Similar yeah, kind of concept. That was a passive house. No, I don't think it's yeah, exactly it's quite the same, but it's got solar panels on the roof, yeah. and south yeah. facing. And we got something it's it's called Forty Percent House. They were working on it as a group at Oxford University, and basically it uses forty percent of the energy of a, a normal house. Yeah. But it's getting this kind of best practice into right. mainstream, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Question from a new contributor. Um, yeah, I feel, with all respect to your wealth and knowledge, I do feel younger than most of you and quite in touch with the younger generation who are blindfolded heading towards a cliff because, because the powers that be are so influenced by big business and are still peddling out the stuff about consuming and that's how what everyone talks about their latest this and their latest that and they really have no clue even though and so I see a big mismatch between what is known and what is being what we are being told mm. uh, this has made me unlike this gentleman lose faith in lobbying MPs and to go with Chris's idea that it's a plan B it's a grassroots there are if you try and be positive as Andrea is there are creative innovative minds out there working on the things and I don't see that the current structure politically um, economically it, it is just going to be crumbling as something new rises I don't I, it's not that I'm apathetic I vote I just think in my mind it almost doesn't matter who you vote for because even if they are rising through the ranks of politics with such high ideals the the limits and the constraints from big business and, and what they're being, you know, the constraints they're working within, making a difference, I really have to put my faith in grassroots stuff. Um, I have a question based on that because I, I always compare myself to my sister, very mainstream, not particularly green, you know, just buys new stuff all the time, whereas we live all this stuff that we're talking about, this is how we live, we make do and then, you know, we live on eBay and recycle and all sorts. But it's, um, and I consider that we're really, we're getting ourselves more resilient and I pick out all the time more things, ways that we can do it. But there's, and there's a minority and it's amazing community feeling. I love that, 
that idea that we are going to have to band together more and that if we're not travelling everywhere, that, that it could create positive human relations. But anyway, my question is, for the, for the my sisters of this world, kind of top, <laughs> buying a new table and tottering towards the cliff, what sort of time scale do you guys individually put on the proverbial jet hitting the fan, whether it's monetarily first, the, I think perhaps the petrol thing, what you're talking about, the, the, the fuel thing. In terms of when I think about a lot of the mainstream people yeah. who are just, you know, how bad is it going to have to get? What's going to really hit them mm. first, in a way? Time. Because I agree, they won't, they won't, no one's going to, no one's telling them they have to change. Mm. They're, they're not mm. going to want to. The comfort zone is there, and that, that, that's, that's it. A, that's it's a gonna cracking be question. How long have we got? I know I'm talking a bit there, but I thought I'd just say all my bit once, but I do want to know about, like, when. Yeah, I reckon. You've written your will. But it's gone. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, we right. do on the update panel, it's on the pile to do. I reckon we're going to start to see the bike this decade. Mm. Yep. Mm. See, that's what my other half is. Financially, yeah, financially, yeah, financially, financially as well. Financially. I think the stock markets are going to probably um, crash within the next year again. Mm. That's just my feeling. Mm. I think uh, get your money out, put the suitcase under the bed. Mm. Yeah. I think we're here. The ham breaks on now. Mm. I think as economies try to grow, they'll immediately hit increased mm. oil prices and bounce back. Mm. Then yeah. they try to grow again, they'll bounce back. That's it. So I think the ham break economically is on now, butting into peak oil, and a lot of the alternatives, whatever they might be such as a solar panel, whatever, whatever, whatever. They depend upon rare earth metals and minerals. Yeah. Mm. And guess who hasn't got them? Mm. The West, China have them. Mm. Mm. So strategically and tactically, I suppose America might burn itself out by invading the whole world, <laughs> as it looks like it is. Mm. But so I, I think we're I think we're the handbrake's on now. Mm. And if you are out of work now, say in this country, and your benefits are cut, it's more than that. You're going over the cliff now mm. in this country um, because the decisions that have been taken are politically driven. Just the the recession, the financial collapse, uh, is being handled through a Milton Friedman program, which doesn't care about social well-being. Mm. So I think that probably economically and socially. We're sort of at it now. There may be the odd flicker of half a percent growth, but if you leave inflation out of it, that sounds good. But if you if, if you've ten years of thirty three percent inflation and sort of you know one percent growth, that's mm. a lot of trouble. Can I? Having said that, I think that um, it makes our message all the more important. Mm. That's Can not to diminish our message; it to enhance mm. the message. Can it's, I add? It's, sorry, it's just interesting that I I am in probably quite a middle class kind of set, if you like, and what you're saying about the people with the least money, the, the more unfortunate yeah. circumstances already in crisis, then that, mm. that's a really important thing. You can see the kids hanging around right in the alleyways, all the way, all the way down to Clinton Crombie Street. They're queued up in alleyways, the kids. Well, there were two yeah. things on the news yeah. tonight, were there, when unemployment was up, but also there was a feature about the rise of zero um, zero hours mm -hmm. con contracts. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether those people count as being employed or unemployed. Mm -hmm. This seems to be a sort of not a zero yeah. hours contract. It's got a bit in the dock docket to secure people. Yeah, the dock yeah. yeah. and, yeah. okay. and it might yeah. get it might not. It's yeah. sort of the same point, but there's no yeah. there's no sort of guarantee of how many hours any time. I mean there's, there's one weird. thing that supports <laughs> Jerry's suggestion that actually the dung is in the ventilation as we speak, <laughs> is, is that um, the, the, you know, the, the Thatcherite monetarist levers for managing the economy that we've had since you know, the very early 80s um, are no longer able to control inflation. And it's always been a trade-off between you know, economic growth, employment and inflation, and that's what they manipulated. Mm. Um, and I think the reason, and the Bank of England is, is fessed up and it says actually, you know, we can't manage inflation the way that we have for the last 30 years. Um, and I think the reasons for that is that the drivers for inflation are no longer 
the simple economic things that we've had to manage in the past, <coughs> the drivers for inflation are actually the kind of the limits to growth that yeah. Chris has rehearsed today. And, and that's the first time that the conventional economics is starting to show mm. the stuff that you know, certain people have been banging on about mm. for, for quite a while. So that means that it's biting now. Mm. So, uh, yes? i got a question. Going on from what you were saying about young people not really having a clue. What, <coughs> and going back to education, um, and I was saying earlier on that mm. <coughs> The loss of the Swindon Secondary Schools, but I think all of us are becoming academies, um, and they're thinking about well, what do we do for the future? Do we set up sixth form? What do we do? What would you say to senior management of a secondary school? How do we get our young people thinking about these issues and learning the skills that are going to be useful for them in the future? Well, for one, you could have people uh, coming in from outside to schools to uh, raise issues like people will and climate change and so on, and you can get the transition people to come along and talk and give general ideas. But then it would be for the, the teachers to take this over and devise it as part of the curriculum. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's teacher, what I was saying. The teachers uh, are getting a short change, though, aren't they? Because they're getting so much put on. Yeah. Like one of the things you had up on there was horticulture. Mm. The news this morning said on the government have now downgraded the BTEC courses on horticulture and agriculture. So the schools will now say, hey, we get marked on what, what there's in the curriculum. They will be taken off. Stupid. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So you can see it's, uh, yeah. what you've got to do your at Lower Shore Farm is a bit more of what you're doing. But it's also got to go spread further afield. You know, it's... Mm. It's getting bad news all round in some ways, and um, like we said, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Right. Couple, we've got about five minutes left, so I, I want to give people a chance to ask any, any burning questions they think they haven't had the chance to ask. And I'll also ask all the panel members perhaps to come up with, I don't know, a, a seed of hope. I don't want us to all go home and cry and, and be paralysed and not change lives as we're all too sad. So, so I'll ask that of the panel and I'll, and I'll give you a sort of a final chance. If, if you think you've got any questions which we haven't touched on, just, just rapidly see if we can get a final question in if there's something we haven't covered. Okay, so that's that's put more pressure on the panel to come up with their seats. <laughs> well, well, so, I was going to ask you, you're the, um, the resilience training manual you mentioned earlier, is that available as a as a resource to do something with in the future? The, the word document, document, yeah. Yes. Well, what it was, was there was a government programme called the Future Jobs Fund, and after the economic crisis, and it, and it took a lot of young people off in Wiltshire, and Wiltshire and Swindon, it took a lot of young people off the unemployment register and get them work experience. Um, and there was an environmental charity in the local authorities put together a program, and that's what I was involved in, putting that bid together. And as part of that program, we, we actually called it the Resilience Curriculum. And it was based on that premise that if you're young and if society has thrown you on the junk pile, you know, what are the skills that you need to, A, make sure you can go through life living more sustainably, but actually, you know, make yourself individually resilient to, you know, what those idiots have done to you. You're on the junk pile because bankers got greedy. So what can you do with your life to stop you being treated by your society like that again? And it's the same skill set. And so we worked it up as a little, you know, it's everything from growing and cooking your own food to getting around on public transport and riding a bike, very practical things. Um, and, and that exists as a, as a Word document, that sort of basic curriculum of life skills that we... we Is that on your scan web page? No, it's not, but it, well, it can be. be something that, that we should did. be put up then. Yeah. The that charity was the Wiltshire yeah. Wildlife Trust yeah. that ran that programme, mm. and it was enormously successful, um, but the current government closed the programme pretty much the day they got elected. Um, so it, it all stopped. Yeah. Um, but but that, that original curriculum um, is, is still there. I think the delivery was actually quite different because these things always change when they hit reality. But what I have got was the curriculum that I drew up for that programme. And we can share that. It's, it's not secret. 
it's nice to spread that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharing is caring. Yeah. So that's a positive thing. Um, I, 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 I put you all on the spot there, but I think it, I, it, we were getting a bit doom and gloomy. I think it's important. I think I said my positive bit sure. before about uh, the, you know, that I do think we're very resilient and um, we'll find ways and maybe we'll learn to actually, you know, maybe we'll be happier living simpler lifestyles, our values will change and we'll learn that we can get more satisfaction out of life. Right. Well, as Chris simpler. said, this transition in Reading, is yes. there a transition in Swindon. Where is transition? Around the country? There's one in Marlborough. Yeah, um, I don't, is there actually one in Swindon? I'm not aware of transition in Swindon. Well, sort of. 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 There's a website and there's maybe a hundred different uh, towns around the country. And there's a lot, it's a growing movement. Yeah. Is it? So, right. yeah, somebody um, asked me after a talk I gave on Monday night, it said to me, okay, what are, to put me on the spot, what are three immediate things you think we could do um, to make a difference transition-wise? I said, well, you can insulate to your home. That's, that's one thing I said about cutting our energy bills by 20%. I said, you can uh, drive less, um, try and do the things that you need um, without travelling uh, over the distances that uh, people tend to. And I quoted the uh, sort of commuter town uh, of Reading uh, example, I said, and get involved in urban permaculture. Mm. Produce your own stuff. Try and get your head around the idea of these good permaculture designs. Um, sort of following the patterns of nature, doing things effectively with lower inputs. So th th those are my sort of immediate three. And they seem quite positive, actually, you know, they're in the right direction, I think. Jerry, yours and then on. He's read my notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, my mind was thinking about the reading you've done, transport 30%, what can you do about your transport? Uh, <coughs> housing fabric, uh, something 20, 22%, what can you do about your house? Mm -hmm. And then some sort of scaling thing, uh, mm -hmm. grow something out in the garden. Mm -hmm. Andrew is very much nicked mine as, as well. But I'm, I'm it's, it's one of the things that it struck me a number of years ago is all these things that we need to do to save the world, you know, almost as a side effect, they're exactly the things that you need to do to make yourself happier and improve your quality of life. And actually, we don't need an environmental crisis to make these changes. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's an organisation called the New Economics Foundation. They're based down in Somerset and they've done a fully researched and referenced piece of work with the evidence base all there which is called the five ways to well-being and they're just sort of five fairly, don't ask me, I can't remember, but they're five fairly simple things that you can do that are about learning skills, spending time in nature, um, you know, building your, your human contacts and your, your that sort of relationship stuff um, and, and it's about that it, outlook of life so you know if you do do one thing um, go and look up the five ways to well-being um, project from the new economics foundation and well, you'll actually see is that a link on your website um, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be a good idea yeah, because we'll one of the things is that easily people Google. go on the website to yeah. find things yeah. so um, so go and look that up as well and and that can change your life um, so <laughs> that, that's it. So I want to thank the panel and Chris Rose.